Well, this is the part where I'd like to go on and on about how grateful I am to be here, and I really am, but the clock is ticking, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and get started and ask you this question. Whose example is the example that will lead you to the highest ground possible? I can think of so many men in scripture that I admire. I think of the great faith of Abraham, and yet if I determine I'm going to follow his example in every way, then I'm going to find myself in a situation where I might think that lying is okay because there were a couple of times when Abraham lied. He was not a perfect man, so he cannot be my example as much as I admire him. I think about great men like Isaiah, and yet Isaiah himself, having seen the glory of God in Isaiah chapter 6, would be the first one to tell us that he would not be the example to follow because his own sins and iniquities, he, know, he, he felt them keenly and know, knew that they needed to be remedied and taken care of by a forgiving God. And you can go through the Bible and you can look for great men. David comes to mind as a man who fought the giant, as a man who, who stood up for so many right things. And yet I would never say that David is going to be my example because of the fact that there were things in his life that I certainly don't want to duplicate or imitate. Aren't you glad that in 1 Peter chapter 2, we find our example that will lead us to the highest ground possible. It's not possible to find a better example than the one described in 1 Peter chapter 2. You remember the text very clearly there from 1 Peter 2 and verse number 21, where the Bible says, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps, I know we've all had the occasion, perhaps growing up during a snowstorm, to see someone's footprints already in the freshly fallen snow. And we go out and we try to absolutely put our footprint within the ones already made without making any brand new footprints. We're trying to walk as they walked. And Jesus Christ is certainly worthy of following. In fact, we sing a song sometimes, and I think the very first line in the song is, trying to walk in the steps of the Savior. That's what I'm wanting to do. I want to follow his example. And you know that word example, it's been pointed out by many preachers before this one, and yet I'll mention it again, that if you look at the original language there, you're talking about a word that means to copy, or to copy under, and there is no better example for us to look to than to look to Jesus Christ and say, how did you live your life I want to try to look as much like you as I possibly can. You remember when you were learning to write your letters, your ABCs, and you remember the graphic above, the model letter, and the model letter was always so perfect. There was not a blemish, there was not anything that was out of line, it was just so perfect. The uppercase and the lowercase letter, and I remember that line underneath, and I remember trying to make my letter look like that model letter. And the more I tried, the better I got at it. But I was never able to duplicate the perfection of that letter in absolute terms. There was always a difference between my attempt and the perfection of the model. And I know that when it comes to trying to be like Jesus, I'm not going to be able to match his absolute perfection. There will be things that need to still be improved, and I need to always be trying to walk in the steps of the Savior and looking to his life every day. And when I see deficiencies, change those deficiencies and try to improve. Preachers sometimes have to remember that old statement that we talk about. This starts behind me and comes forward because we're also men who need to improve and who need to be better than we were before, and we might have uh, done a lot of things better than we used to, but we're still striving to be even more like our highest example of all, Jesus Christ. Now, in specific, how can I be like Christ? What kind of example will he leave, did he leave, and what will happen if I follow his example? Number one tonight, if I follow his example, 
I will understand and exhibit humility. If you'll go with me to Philippians chapter 2, you'll notice that marvelous text where we are reminded in verse number 3 that we're not just to uh, let anything be done through strife or vain glory, but rather in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves and look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, do we have any examples in scripture of that kind of selflessness? Indeed, verse five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What kind of humility did he show? He's God, he's the word, he's with God, and he becomes flesh, he's willing to become flesh. He's willing to leave his position and to become a human being so that you and I might be saved. He, he didn't consider his equality with God a thing to be grasped, as the American Standard Version puts it, but rather, verse seven, he made himself of no reputation and he took upon him the form of a servant was made in the likeness of man. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and was made in the likeness of men, the Bible tells us, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And what did that lead to? God highly exalted him. Now, I don't want to be like that guy that called his mother every year to congratulate her on his birthday. I don't want to be like that guy that I heard about who joined the Navy so the world could see him. I don't want to be like that guy. I want to be like Christ to the best of my ability. And you know, when you hear someone talk about themselves and they are constantly using the I, I, I and the my, 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 and it's always, they're the hero of every story, uh, that can get uh, very tedious very quickly. Jesus Christ did all the magnificent things that he did and tried to point to the glory of the Father rather than to his own self-glorification. And Jesus Christ shows us how to humble ourselves and to put the needs and interests of others above our own. Notice next, not only if I follow his example will I demonstrate his humility, I will exhibit his submission. I love John chapter four and verse 34, where Jesus makes it clear that his very purpose in coming, his very task was to, verse 34 of John four, do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And then John 6, 38 echoes this very thought when he says in John chapter six and verse number 38, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Notice the selflessness and the submissive attitude of Jesus. And he was that way with his parents. Remember Luke 2, 51 and 52 talks about how he was subject unto them. And Jesus was subject unto his father. You remember how he was in the days of his flesh. Hebrews 5, 7 emphasizes his fleshly nature. He was God in the flesh. And in that fleshly body, he poured out his heart in supplication to God and said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He was willing to submit to the Father's will in every degree. I like hearing or telling about that story that I don't know who originated it, but it teaches a valuable point about submission. Farmer decides to leave a will for his boys after his demise and the boys pick up the will and say, uh-huh, this is what father wanted. Number one, I want you to build a fence at this spot on the property. They looked at each other and said, isn't that the absolute perfect place to build a fence? Father was a genius. That's where we're going to build the fence. There's not a better place to build a fence. We're gonna build the fence right there where father's will says to. Father's will says build a barn at this spot on the property. Brother, can you think of a better place for a barn than right there where Father's will said to put it? No, I can't. He was so bright. We're going to put the barn right where his will says to put it. You couldn't think of a better place to put a barn than where he said put it. Uh, he said dig a well at this spot on the property. Now, brother, you and I agreed dad was, he was so smart. 
But I, I think he missed it this time. What do you think? Yeah, I don't think that's the, I don't think that's the best place for that well. Don't you think the well would be better over here instead? So, how many of the three stipulations that their father's will dictated did they submit to? And place the emphasis on the word submit. How many of those three stipulations did they submit to? And the answer is zero. He said, no, no, you said that they built the fence right where their father's will said to build it. And why? Well, that's where they thought the fence ought to go. You said that they thought the barn should go where father's will said to build it. And they built it right where they and their father happened to coincide in their conviction. That's the best place for a barn. The very first time their will and their father's will collided, what did they do? jettisoned their father's will and said, we'll do our own. I don't know who originated this statement, but I like it. It said, if I believe in the Bible, only the things with which I agree, it's not really the Bible I believe, it's me. If I believe in the Bible, only the things with which I agree, it's not really the Bible I believe in, it's me. And certainly Jesus shows us a better way and he learned obedience by the things which he suffered according to Hebrews chapter 5 verses 8 and 9 and he was willing to say father if it's possible but not my will but thine be done and then he would say no man takes my life from me I lay it down willingly I'm submitting to the will of my father and he wouldn't you love to be able to say what Jesus said in John 8 29 I do always those things that please him. I would like to stand here and tell you tonight that as I survey my life and look at myself as a Christian, as a preacher, that I could say I've always done what pleases the Lord in every single circumstance. I've always done what pleases him without exception. I cannot say that, though I've never deliberately in, in my life, well, I can't even say that I've never deliberately violated his will in my lifetime. There are times when uh, I especially remember living contrary to the good teaching I had when I was going through a certain younger phase of my life. And so I know that submission means I yield. I yield to him. And I don't yield to the impulses of the flesh, but rather I yield to the Father and his will. Notice next, if I follow the example of Jesus, I'll seek to be meek and lowly. And he said, come unto me, all you that labor under heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He says, rest unto your souls will be granted. He says, for I am meek and lowly, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. I want to be like Jesus. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. And then Paul himself would later refer to in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the meekness and the gentleness that he tried to exhibit as he was trying to follow and walk in the steps of the Savior. He was very interested in being meek and lowly. And I want to be that. By the way, meekness is not weakness, is it? The meek Savior, Jesus Christ, was very strong to stand against false doctrine and to stand against those Pharisees. And so meekness doesn't equal weakness, but it certainly is the opposite of arrogance and self-promotion to the point of just drawing attention to oneself rather than to God. Even Jesus says, I want you to see through me the Father in heaven. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We're not seeking self-glorification. We're seeking the exaltation of Christ and of his father whom he tried to live for all the days of his life. Notice next, I will learn what is written if I follow his example. And we'll say a little bit more about this tomorrow in the message on though Satan's darts at me are hurled. But I want you to notice here in Matthew chapter four that in the temptation that our Lord experienced with Satan, you remember that Satan tried to appeal to what he thought might be a weak point in the Savior by, at a time when he would have been hungry, commanding that stones be made bread. 
But Jesus' first words out of his mouth show us how important it is to know this book. It is written. But that's not the last time. After the next, next temptation, Jesus' response to it, first words out of his mouth in dealing with that temptation, it is written again. And then when the last temptation is brought before him there, he said, get thee hence, Satan, it is written. It is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Jesus shows us the magnificence of the power of this word. God embedded this word with such power that it can be the very source by which I'm able to overcome the wiles of the devil. I have to know what is written though before I can use it to my advantage. I heard about a lady that went up to a preacher that was well known for his scholarship in the scriptures and she said, I would give about half of my life to know the Bible as well as you do. And he said, that's what it cost me, about half of my life. He had to get up, study, spend time in the book. It doesn't come by osmosis. You don't put your Bible under your pillow at night, wake up in the morning, a Bible scholar. It doesn't happen that way. And one of the worst things you and I can ever do is get to the point where we start resting on what we already know rather than continuing to try to learn and grow. I, I remember a preacher came up to my dad and to me at the Freed Hardeman lectures years ago. He was so excited. He said, I finally done it. And I used to hear this kind of stuff and thought it was maybe just make-believe stuff. No, no, I heard this with my own ears. This preacher said to me and to my dad, I finally done it. And we said, what have you done? He said, I finally have. 208 sermons. I'll never have to write another sermon. What's the significance of 208? Well, if there are 52 weeks in a year and you preach twice on Sunday, that's 104, and you preach the next year 104, that gives you 208. And he was already planning to move to a congregation, put his sermons, all of them, in one drawer and start preaching through them at the new place. And then when he got down to where the stack was looking like it was diminishing pretty well, that's when he'd start sending out resumes for the next place. And he'd take his 208 sermons with him there too. And he was determined he was done studying. He really didn't have to study anymore. I say this all the time and I'm not just saying it to say it. I walk down the halls of the school sometime and I'm listening as teachers are teaching the students, and I'm thinking, that's good material. I, I wish I could stop right now and go in there and just be in that class and hear everything that they're learning. Is there any, what is, I don't remember whether it was T.B. Laramore, or which pioneer preacher it was, maybe you can help me with this after services if you remember, but one preacher is noted for saying that every time he walked to the Bible to study it, he felt like he was a man walking to the ocean with a teaspoon to dip it dry. The inexhaustible nature of scripture shows us that it's inspired of God and you can study a passage for 40 years, read it so many times and then see something that's always been there but you didn't notice it until this particular time. That's how amazing this book is, how much depth it possesses and so I want to follow the example and learn what is written. Why are you here tonight? I'm sure you're here because you really do want to learn what is written. Why is this lectureship so well attended year after year? Because thankfully we have good brethren out there in this area and from far away who will come all this way to try to learn what's written here because they know the power of this word. Jesus' example shows us that. Notice next, I will worship regularly. There's a statement in Luke 4 about Jesus that is very interesting to notice. It says, as his custom was. Jesus Christ was accustomed to going to the synagogues and being involved in the synagogue activities and the teaching and the reading of scripture, the explanation of scripture is what Jesus excelled in. And so Luke chapter four and verse 16 says, it was his custom to go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day 
And you and I need to grow up in a home, thank God many of us did grow up in a home where the custom was, we're going to services. I remember as a little, little boy, getting up one morning and seeing snows all over the ground. And sometimes little boys don't have all of the uh, spiritual bones they need to have yet. And I remember thinking, we may not be going to church today. I'll be playing in the snow all day. And my dad says, you boys about ready in there. I'm like, well, dad, have you not seen outside? It's it snowed. Well, we lived up north, by the way, where you uh, got out and went pretty much when the snow was there, unless there was some blizzard conditions. Generally speaking, we were able to get out and about, and we did. And so I remember that day being impressed with the fact that my dad wasn't hampered by this whatsoever. And all my life, I did not, on vacation, I never wondered whether we were or were not going to stop and attend services on the Lord's Day. I knew we were. It was our custom. I was blessed to have godly parents who drilled that into me and taught me that by their example. And whose example were they following? Above others, Jesus Christ, above all others. And then I will pray more fervently if I follow his example. Jesus talked to God. He would, according to Luke 6 and verse 12, he prayed all night before he selected his apostles. Mark 1, 35, he got up a great while before day. And he went out into a solitary place where he wouldn't be interrupted or distracted. And there he prayed. If the very Son of God needed to pray, and got benefit out of praying, then certainly I need it. And as I follow his example, I will do what he did in John 17, lift up my eyes to heaven and I will pray to God and ask for his blessings and favor. Notice next, I will love as he loved if I follow his example. Jesus wasn't the first one to ever show us how to love but he's the first one to ever show us how to love like he loved. In John chapter 13, you'll recall the statement that is made there in verse number 34, a new commandment. Well, wait, the Old Testament commands love. What makes this so new? A new commandment. I give to you that you love one another. Here it is. As I have loved you that you also love one another. And by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if you teach the right plan of salvation. Well, that's true, but that's not all there is to it. If you have the right pattern for church organization, well, that's true, but that's not the very specific thing mentioned by Jesus in this context. The others matter and shouldn't be left out, but neither should this be left out. What is it that I want to be like Jesus in? I want to be like him in the way that I love others. And I love them and put their interests above my own. That's what I'm striving for. It's what I want to be better at. And then notice, I will be a servant. As I start closing out here, I want you to please observe that Jesus, of, if anyone had a right to be served, it's the Son of God. No one could measure up to his greatness, and yet he didn't walk around with that air. He didn't ever deny who he was, and he made it absolutely clear who he was, but he wasn't arrogant in his nature. In Matthew chapter 10, you'll notice the statement that is made. In Matthew chapter 10, and make it Mark 10 and verse 45. That's be better because that's actually where it is. It's in Mark, Mark 10, 45. The son of man didn't come to be ministered unto, but rather he came to minister unto others and to give his life as a ransom for many. And the ultimate exhibition of this is John 13, when you see Jesus Christ serving in a, if anyone could have said, look, I am the one in this room that deserves to be served more than any other, it would have been Jesus. But rather than sitting there and thinking, well, is someone else going to do what needs to be done? He arose from the supper according to John 13. He laid aside his garments, verse four. He took a towel, 
This is the Son of God girding himself and pouring water into a basin and beginning to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Even Judas's feet, the one that he knew had conspired to bring about his arrest, yes, even his. The Son of God. The Son of God shows us the example. In fact, he says in John chapter 13 and verse 14, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you what? An example that ye should do as I have done to you. The servant's not greater than his Lord. And look what I've done. As your Lord, I've shown you true service. Go out and act this way. Don't argue among yourselves which of us is going to be the greatest. Who will be the greatest disciple? Jesus says, don't act that way. Act this way. This is the way you ought to act. And just to summarize, if I follow his example, I will teach what is good and I'll go about doing good. Acts 10, 38, he went about doing good. And Acts 1, 1, the things that be, Jesus began both to do and to teach. And if I follow his example, talk about reaching higher ground. If I follow him where he leads, I'll follow, we sometimes sing. Follow all the way. I want to end up, where will I end up if I follow his example? If I try to walk in his steps, what will the destination be? Heaven above. I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go, I'm coming again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I want to follow him all the way to the Father. And if I follow him and the GPS he gave me, the gospel plan of salvation, that's where I'll be. It's where you'll be. It's where all of us will be. May God bless us all as we strive to follow his example and end up living where he lives.